Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church's Sermon Podcast. On this podcast, you will hear the latest sermon taken from our worship service every week. Our hope is that through this message, you will find joy and comfort in knowing the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. And our text is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. There are things in nature that are impossible to explain. There are some things in history, phenomena that happened that just can't be explained. You say they can't be explained when none of the words from your vocabulary adequately describes your experience to a listener in such a way that the listener can equate a similar experience. For example, in communicating the Gospels, missionaries have to bridge this gap in describing scriptural teaching with something unrelated to the local people's known world. In Panama, for example, I was teaching about things that test and try our faith, which actually make us stronger. St. Peter describes this using the example of gold being refined by fire, burning off the dross and impurities to make it more valuable. But in rural Panama, people don't have the experience of gold or refining, so the best wording or image or example to communicate this was to talk about how sugarcane fields were burned off before the harvest to get rid of rats and other animals, It removes the impurities from the harvest so the cane can be harvested. Searching for words to communicate the meaning and experience, I changed the imagery into something they knew, something they had experienced, something they were familiar with. That is what the Gospel writers Matthew, Mark, and Luke had to wrestle with in describing the experience of the transfiguration of our Lord. Up until now, Jesus has brought joy to all wherein he has revealed what the kingdom of God is like and who he is, the Messiah. He has communicated in a way that is familiar to the Jewish leaders and to common people alike. He has revealed himself as the source of joy to a prostitute, tax collector, persistent widow, a Samaritan. And through these parables, he has brought the joy of his good news to us as well. But today is quite different. There are no more parables. This is an historical event witnessed by three people. Jesus brings joy to the disciples that searches for the right words and images to tell the story. This is important for us today, so I'll repeat this. We say that there are things that can't be explained when none of the words from your vocabulary adequately describe your experience to a listener in such a way that the listener can equate a similar experience of their own. So now, God creates an event that uses images from the history of Israel to reveal who he is. Peter, James, and John will connect the dots from thousands of years of Old Testament history, and the Gospel writers will search the words to describe this because it's important for our joy as well. Possibly above all other events described in the Bible, there is so much coming together here that we need to see what impacted the disciples and how Jesus revealed himself. First, Luke says that this happened about eight days after other events. Not exactly, but about eight days, he says. Eight bears significance. The number eight for the Jews was significant of new life. Eight days after a birth, there was the circumcision. New life was given. Eight people were in the ark, and new life was given after the flood. Many baptismal fonts today have eight sides, representing new life. So Luke considers this a new life situation. Second, the events leading up to this are important as well. Peter just confesses that Christ is the Son of the living God, almost a chapter before. Jesus predicts his crucifixion and resurrection, in which he says, Take up your cross and follow me, and the disciples will follow him even unto death. Then right before we head up to the mountain, Jesus says that there are disciples who will not taste death 
before they see the kingdom of God. Those not tasting death are Peter, James, and John. They are seeing the kingdom of God revealed in Christ Jesus. We're told that Jesus takes three people with him. To the Jews, any truth or fact needed the testimony of three people, three eyewitnesses. Throughout the Old Testament, this is evident. Passages reveal this truth, and Peter writes about it in his second letter as well. But what's more, the disciples see the immediate implications of this event because Moses took Joshua with him to the mountain of God on Sinai. But here in Joshua is the same name in Hebrew as Jesus. But now here Moses does not take Joshua, but rather meets Jesus on the mountain. Throughout the Old Testament, God communicates with his people on mountaintops. These are places of divine appearance. Mount Moriah, where the sacrifice of Isaac took place. David builds an altar on Moriah and Solomon, his temple. Mount Sinai, God appears in the burning bush to Moses, and this is also where the Ten Commandments are given. Mount Hor, Aaron dies and his son is vested as high priest. Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel, where curses and blessings were given. Mount Nebo, where Moses sees the promised land and is buried by God in the mountain. But there's one more mountain which we normally don't think of. The Garden of Eden, the creation of life is referred to in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. The Garden of Eden is referred to as the Holy Mountain of God. God dwells and walks with his creation in Mount Eden. And so the mountaintop is where God reveals himself. Do you get the idea that creation and new life are what is coming together for the disciples here as they go up the mountain of transfiguration, transfiguration with Jesus? They are seeing Jesus as he who speaks from the mountaintop, that word of God made flesh, now appearing before them. This, now, as the disciples see and hear, is where Jesus discusses his departure with Moses and Elijah. His departure in Greek is his exodus, a word that rings freedom and liberation and new life in the ears of any Hebrew, and certainly for Peter, James, and John. Jesus is going to depart, but as what? Is he going to leave them? This departure was otherworldly. How can they describe it? They see him transformed. The Greek for transformed is metamorphized. He's changed into light, white, burning light. He's not like them. And neither are Moses or Elijah. What's more, Moses and Elijah are not dead. But they're living, they're breathing, they're seeing, they're touching, and they're speaking with Jesus. White and shining light have always been the way Jesus and God have presented themselves. Moses saw God and his face and hair turned white as snow. The man on the throne in Ezekiel's vision was like glowing metal in Ezekiel chapter 1, who is the manifestation of the Son of God. The Ancient of Days coming to judge the earth in the end times in Daniel 7 verse 9 is clothed in all white and has a long white beard. And in Psalm 104, chapter 104 verse 2, God appears to David and David writes, He covers himself in light. The angels at the open tomb of Jesus and at his ascension are white as light. And in Revelation chapter 19, the white horses and white robes of the faithful are pure as light. Jesus is no mortal here on the mountaintop, but the glory of the Father. The disciples, Jesus, Moses representing the law, and Elijah representing the prophets, are in the kingdom of God. It's just as Jesus said, there will be some who will not die before they see the kingdom of God. Can you imagine what is going through the minds of the disciples? Jesus was changed into his glorious light as before them, and they were at changed as well. They would never be the same. They don't want to come down from the mountain. They want to stay in heaven building altars. How could they not know now who Jesus is? It's obvious. Their experience in the words of the Father, listen to my beloved Son. You don't need more than that. What joy. What rapture. How could they miss what this Messiah was all about? Yet they did. 
after they go down from the mountain, after a short time, Peter will defend Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and cut off Malchus's ear. He will deny Christ three times. And all the disciples will flee when he's crucified. They will fear his judgment, his resurrection, and hide in an upper room for fear of being arrested and sentenced to death. We really can't blame them, though, because we too miss the Messiah, don't we? I mean, like the disciples, we know the teaching and we know the Bible verses, we make confession and receive forgiveness in the worship service, but in the day-to-day, we really miss Jesus right before our eyes. We underestimate his presence with us, and when we experience difficult times or in worrisome situations. And it's not like we haven't had mountaintop experiences. There are times in our lives when Jesus is right in front of us, and we don't see it. That time you did not die in a car accident. That time you woke up from the anesthesia only to find yourself still breathing and then recuperating. That time you had to drive late at night on the highway alone and were scared but made it home. That time fill in the blank. Perhaps at that time you did thank God and Maybe you did feel his presence, but the presence was short-lived, like the Thanksgiving was. Life went on as usual, as normal, day by day. The experiences of of that joy, of that closeness with God are short-lived. We all come down from our mountaintop experiences in which we felt God's closeness or God's presence, but sometimes forget that he reveals his kingdom to us every day each day, day by day. We just miss it, like the disciples did after coming down from their ecstatic revelation. But that same Savior who gave them joy when they saw his glory descended with them once again into the real world, but they were were still transformed. Transformed. That's us. That's you and me. Even after experiencing the closeness of God's presence in a life event, He is still there. Even though that joy wanes and we are not so keen on seeing God in our lives, he's still there. That's what happened to us in baptism, a transformation. You are shown the miracle of the kingdom of God at work in this world. You are given new life. For some people, that's eight days after they were born, and for others, it's a bit later in life. Paul reminds us to hold on to that transformation we have received when he writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, that's metamorphous, by the renewing of your mind so that you may know what is the will of God. And this is not the will of God for your life, but rather the will of God, the plan of God for salvation. Be transformed. Your mind is renewed. You see things in a different way. Our baptism has transformed us into citizens of this kingdom, in this world. Our baptism follows us down the mountain. Christ dwells in us on the street. We are his. Christ dwells with us at work. We are his. Christ dwells within us, giving us words to share our faith. We are his. We are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. We are his glory. We see his kingdom transform us through bread and wine, his body and blood, where he swallows our death up in his and bestows on us his life. His death and resurrection transforms us to show his glory in the world. We are, as Paul writes to the Ephesians, God's workmanship in Christ that we sometimes miss that joy in our day-to-day by trying to make those ends. This joy is what Martin Luther King Jr. saw in his mountaintop speech. 
the kingdom of heaven on earth, where all people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. His sermon is based on the transfiguration, yours and mine, into a society as we follow Christ, where everyone lives for each other. Christ has transformed us of all people to live for the other, in love for the other, because we have been to the mountaintop. Clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we are forgiven and shine forth as a light in this world. What does Isaiah say? He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. That is joy for you. Joy for you and joy for me. We have been transformed by God's Spirit through the preaching of his word to see this world through eyes in a way that nobody in this world can see it. Like nobody in this world has experienced. We have seen and have experienced the kingdom of God in our lives, the forgiveness of sins, and the reality of eternal life and the glory of God. We are never alone. Yes, your eyes may dim from time to time as this world assaults us, but his eye is on the sparrow. And so he watches over you, and you are his. Joy to you. Amen. To know more about Jesus and our ministry at Grace Lutheran Church, please find us at www.gracealoneonline.org. You will find additional sermon podcasts on your favorite podcast channel every week. You will also find information on our online worship service schedule and Bible studies at www.gracealoneonline.org forward slash sermons. You may also submit any prayer requests at gracealoneonline.org forward slash prayer. Thank you for listening to God's word for you today.